actually a much harder technical uh, challenge to solve given right. that there's limit as to how much you eat the brain tissue. Uh, whereas in for phones and you, have a hot watch you don't or actually really care <laughs> how much if it's sitting on a table. Sure. So yeah, so, so it's got to go through scan and stuff mm -hmm. as well in our mm -hmm. case. So it's a, it is a tougher challenge to, to charge and to uh, have high bandwidth communications uh, given that it's got to go through uh, skin and hair and stuff. But we have solved it. But we have solved it, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, so our first uh, step with the telepathy is basically to unlock uh, digital independence for people with paralysis and to allow them to control the computer just with their mind without moving their body. And uh, our goal is to provide them the same level of control, functionality, and reliability that I have when I'm using a computer. Even better than uh, the level of control I have. And, it's not a high bar for you. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, yeah. just to be clear, this guy, he's controlling this with his brain. So he's not, like, you can't see his hands in this video, but he's not using a mouse and keyboard. Just, you know, thinking about how to move the cursor and playing Civilization 6. No eye tracker. Right, there's no eye tracking yeah. from I mean, thought. He's, he's live streaming. He's, like, this you can is, go watch this on Twitter. Just thinking. Yeah, That's just thinking. it. This like, is just a couple days like ago. cursor move here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah this is like last night or two nights ago or something? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. I think, I think the way he also described it is he's using the... He has many more videos on his uh, on the platform. Definitely check them out. Yeah, so he can, he's streaming that live and also can talk and like move his head without the problem multi-time. Yeah, you can also, like, if you join his live stream, you can ask him questions. He'll, he'll tell you all about what it's like to move the brain. Also, I think, uh, I haven't played Civilization myself, um, but I think this is actually not easy mode. This is expert mode. This is emperor mode. Yeah. Emperor mode. Yes. <laughs> if you have played Civ, emperor mode is like the highest difficulty level. Just the point is like this is a cognitively demanding task mm -hmm. while live streaming, playing the hardest mode game, and uh, he's able to do that while moving, yeah. person. talking, yeah. engaging with uh, you know the audience. Yeah. One of the other games he likes to play a lot is chess. Yeah. I think it gets lost sometimes that he's actually playing speed chess against me. Yeah, which <laughs> requires an incredibly high fidelity degree of control uh, and, and speed of control in order to be able to win. So also another cool stuff about about our device is that you use it anywhere, anytime. Also on a plane during a flight uh, while uh, creating really cool memes of care. Um, also, our device uh, unlocks things that previously were impossible for our participants. Uh, for example, uh, we're able to connect him to uh, his uh, gaming console, which uh, they uh, Mario Kart with friends and family, and it was uh, lovely to see them playing together after years, uh, but he couldn't do it uh, since he's injured. Imagine if you're sitting on row over from this guy <laughs> on a plane. If you look over, he's making a cat meme. Uh, no, no hands, no movement. Yeah. Live in a real world. Yeah, it's strange, strange time. Yeah, and uh, he loves play, uh, using the device and using independently daily to watch videos, uh, read, uh, play games uh, using the browser. And the key metrics that we care is to make sure our device is actually useful is to Basically, the amount of hours we use the device daily and weekly, and we track it uh, weekly since the since the surgery. And on weeks that he's not too busy and not traveling, he can even reach 70 hours uh, of using the device a week. This is amazing. And um, he would, of course, love to use it more, but need to run uh, research sessions. Uh, he needs to sleep sometimes, and also, of course, to charge the device once in a while. Hopefully, we'll improve that over time. I think maybe not obvious to people who are watching this. Like, it's a normal MacBook he's controlling. This isn't like some limited vision thing where there's only a few options. Like, you can just do anything that you can do on a MacBook Pro. Uh, same one I have on my desk, actually. It's the exact same one. And uh, maybe another interesting point is that on the first day he used BCI, brain control, he was able to break the previous world record for cursor control just by uh, uh, using the brain. And recently he even uh, doubled it and was able to uh, outperform about 10% of our uh, engineered Neuralink. And you can be sure that we are very good in this game and very quick. And if you want to check out how well, uh, how well you can do it, you can do it on our website. And it's very uh, addictive games. Yeah, so, it's, it's, it's a very simple game. You just have to click on the square. But <laughs> it's actually, even though it sounds silly, it's it's quite a, it sounds like it could be quite addictive. And it's, it's especially if you get a low score and you think there's no way I got to. I mean, any, anyone who wants to try this, I recommend going to the Neuralink.com website and seeing seeing if you can beat Nolan's record. And it's that you will find that's actually quite difficult to do so. And this is really with version one of the device and with only a small percentage of the electrodes that are working. This is really just the beginning, but even the beginning is twice as good as the world record. This is important to emphasize. Um, you know, the media has a habit of saying that the glass is 10% empty, but actually <laughs> it's 90% full. So I think it's really quite an accomplishment of the Neuralink team to have achieved with the first patient, the first device, twice the world record for the brain to computer uh, mad width. That's a, it's really an astonishing, an amazingly great outcome. And it's only going to get better from here. So the, the potential 
is to ultimately get, I think, to megabit level. So that's that's part of the long-term goal of improving the, the bandwidth of the brain-computer interface. If you think about like how low the bandwidth normally is between a human and a device, the average bandwidth is extremely low. It's, it's less than one bit per second over the course of a day. So if there are 86,400 seconds in a day, uh, you're outputting less than that number of bits to uh, any any given device, except in perhaps very rare circumstances. So it's actually quite important for human AI symbiosis is just being able to communicate at a speed the AI can follow. So yeah, just to emphasize again, he's performing at this extremely high level with about 15% of his channels functional. And so we want to mitigate any of the problems that led to that situation. So, you know, the brain is a fascinating organ. I'll share with you some of the secrets about the brain. During any typical brain surgery, a small amount of air is introduced into the skull. That's because neurosurgeons like to have as much room as possible around the brain. And so uh, there's this little known control mechanism of allowing the CO2 concentration in the blood to rise a bit which allows the brain to either expand or contract depending on where you target that CO2. But typically neurosurgeons will have the brain shrink by lowering CO2. What we're going to do in our future surgeries is keep the CO2 concentration actually quite normal, maybe even slightly elevated, and that'll allow the brain to stay its normal size and shape during surgery. That should eliminate this air pocket that we saw in the first participant. Uh, that air pocket we think may have contributed to eating up some of the thread slack as the air bubble migrated to be under the implant, push the brain away from the implant. And so that's easy enough to fix. Another consideration that we want to focus on for our upcoming participants is that the brain, think of it like a really complex folded onion. It's layer upon layer of sheets of neurons all over the surface of the brain folded into this odd looking shape. The folds of the brain travel down deep into the brain and along with it go those onion layers of neurons. And if we insert very close to one of the folds where there may be very useful information encoded in neurons, we may end up traveling with our threads parallel to some of the layers of neurons that we're most interested in, avoiding them entirely. Uh, to avoid that possibility, we're going to insert uh, in our future participants more close to the middle of the apex of the folds, uh, ensuring that we're crossing the layers of interest, layer five of the cortex. I also think that it's important to um, highlight here the, those tiny wires that Elon mentioned. They're a fraction of a human hair. They're very flexible, intentionally so, because you know brains are constantly moving and you want the electrodes to be moving with the brain, causing less of the scarring. It's actually impossible for a human neurosurgeon, how, however talented uh, Matthew is, to actually maneuver them. Like, we have a surgical robot that we built that can actually precisely target them in any three-dimensional space, X, Y, as well as Z, with micron-level precision, while avoiding vasculature so that you don't disrupt and, and cause immune response from happening. So we actually have the technology to be able to place them exactly where we want. Uh, in it's truly amazing to see the surface of the brain after the robot had inserted all the electrodes on the first participant without a drop of blood in sight. It's really quite an achievement. Yes, yeah, so, so something that probably most people don't realize is that the brain appears to be somewhat undifferentiated. So if you look at the cortex, it looks like a whole bunch of folds that where it's not obvious just looking at, it, say, a picture of the brain, that it's the brain is highly differentiated, that there's you, you pretty much know exactly where the part of the brain is that uh, controls your right hand and your left hand and your leg and that, that kind of thing, or vision. It's, it's actually quite precisely located. It's not, you, so some people like might think, look at the brain like, oh, it could be anywhere. But actually your brain is highly differentiated, even though it doesn't look, yeah. So, yeah. Do you want to describe how we actually, where, like how we identify where to drill the cranium? Yeah, thing? so yeah. we can put a patient that is considering this implant uh, into an fMRI, so functional magnetic resonance imaging machine, and ask them to imagine hand movements that, you know, because of the spinal cord injury don't happen. But just imagining those hand movements causes these areas of the brain to light up uh, in the fMRI scanner. And so we have a pretty good idea based in, in fact uh, for each individual participant, which part of their brain is going to respond to imagined movements of the hand. And so we can map those imagined movements, much as we all do uh, when moving a mouse, to controlling a cursor on a screen even without the use of a mouse. Yeah, but anyway, I think this is kind of an important point. Like, it's not like the part of your brain that controls your hand might be anywhere in the cortex. It's <laughs> This is not the case. It's going to be in a very specific region, and it's going to be extremely common across people. Precision is key. Too. Yeah. So. The left-handed, right-handed, in my mind, too. Like, if you're 
right-handed, you want the device on the left side. Yeah. The ultralateral side to the hand that's your dominant. Yeah. The left side of your brain controls right side of your brain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everything's crossed. Another of the risk mitigations we're looking at in the future yeah. is that, you know, the, the implant has a certain size. The depth of the bottom of the implant is actually thinner than the average human skull. And so what we want to be able to do is control the size of the gap under the implant, give the threads that travel from the implant into the brain uh, as much slack as possible. We didn't do this in the first participant because we didn't want to you know, manipulate any of their tissue that we didn't absolutely have to. In upcoming implants, uh, our plan is to sort of sculpt the surface of the skull uh, very intentionally to uh, minimize the gap under the implant such that the bottom of the implant travels perfectly flush with the normal uh, contour of the inner side of the skull. That will put the implant closer to the brain, eliminate some of the tension on the threads. And we think it will reduce some of the tendency of threads to retract the brain. And we actually built the pool to do that. Yeah, this, this is actually a very important detail. You, you really want the inner contour of the skull to be flush. So that the implant, there's no, the brain doesn't want to pucker up into mm -hmm. the gap. That's really quite a big deal. Minimizing the air pocket and the implant being flush with the inside contour of the skull is, are two very important uh, mm -hmm. improvements. The additional benefit here is that you know you do see some amount of stick up, what we call stick up, so you minor bump in the head, <laughs> but this actually eliminates that even further. Yeah, you, yeah. I mean, it's like really, we, our goal is that if you run your hand over the top of the skull, you don't feel any any mm -hmm. bump, you don't feel any any device, and that even if someone was bold, you wouldn't really even notice it. And then from the inner contour of the skull, the brain. From a physical standpoint, doesn't really notice that there's a divot in the skull mm -hmm. because there's no divot. Okay, another <laughs> aspect of uh, of the human brain that you know obviously differs from any of the animals that we tested in is that the human brain is a lot bigger, and so you may not realize that that means the the human brain moves quite a bit more than any of these other smaller brained creatures. And so when we open the skull, we see the brain travel toward and away from the robot about three millimeters in total as the heart beats and, and the breathing uh, takes place. And so that movement, you know, it, it adds a small challenge for the robot uh, in precisely choosing a depth to insert each thread. It's not an enormous challenge, and we've already upgraded the robot's capabilities to be able to even more precisely uh, target depth in, in even a very uh, rapidly moving brain uh, with a high amplitude of movement. You may think the most obvious mitigation for threads that pulled out of the brain is to insert them deeper. We think so too. Uh, and so we're going to broaden the range of depths at which we insert threads. So, you know, for the very first participant, we had an enormous amount of data from our animal work, and we had very highly optimized our insertion depth to maximize the crossing of the layers of interest in the cortex with the electrodes that we're recording from. Now that we know retraction is a possibility, we're going to insert at a variety of depths that even in several cases of differing amounts of retracting threads, we're going to have electrodes at the proper depth. And with the deepest threads, be able to track how much retraction has occurred across the surface of the brain um, from, from each thread. And so we're going to you know, both have more threads in the right layer and have better data on how much retraction has occurred. If you're a BCI nerd, you might know that being able to control individual Z depth Per thread is not something that most uh, neural interface devices offer. Most neural interface devices are kind of a static, fixed, rigid array that you push in, and all the electrodes are at one depth. Right. And to be able to do this is actually a pretty, pretty novel part of the robot. Yeah, the experience. historical approach is to actually pound in a sort of bed of nails with an air hammer into the brain. It looks, it looks crazy. Yeah. That, that, that is, yeah, yeah just <laughs> with a pneumatic hammer. It sounds somewhat barbaric. This is not what we do, but this is what's been done before. Is yeah. literally just hammering in what looks like a bed of nails into the brain, that's, which that's even actually better, works. Uh, it's astonishing that it actually works. <laughs> yeah. well, but, you know. I mean, some people like manually, like DBS probes, you're just sticking in by hand. Our right. surgeons just hiding in there. So those are those several are several orders of magnitude more volume of brain tissue that you're destroying compared yeah. to what we're doing. But, but that deep brain simulation stuff does actually work. It, it does. actually yeah. helps people a lot. Yeah. Um, of thousands. Yeah, yeah. That's a great product. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, I think we'll, we'll be able to do a much more finessed version of that down the road. I mean, it's really difficult. The Neuralink device is something that really absolutely minimizes damage to the brain, absolutely minimizes the load on the patient. And the goal is to allow someone to live a completely normal life, that you won't even notice that someone even has the device. So like I said, we're rest restoring the ability to control your computer and phone. So that's a telepathy. And then the next device being able to allow people to see that could not see before. And in fact, you could be allow people to see kind of like Doherty of the Forge in Star Trek in any, whatever. Infrared. Yeah, infrared, ultraviolet, radar. 
So I think another way of saying it is that we want to give people superpowers. So it's, it's not just that we're restoring your prior brain functionality, but that you actually have functionality far greater than a normal human. That's a super big deal. And, and I also think, you know, oftentimes the questions that we get a lot is, why do you have to actually go into the brain? What if you place it on the surface or outside the skull? Basically, the long story short, the physics of how it works, you really need to get the sensors, which are these facing in the brain, next to the source, which neuron, as close to it as possible. Otherwise, what you get is you get a population response and not be able to kind of do the level of controls that we believe. Of. Yeah, I mean, a good sort of analogy would be like, if you're trying to understand what goes on in a factory, you kind of need to go into the factory. You can't just put a stethoscope on the wall and try to figure out what's going on. Like any, anything on the outside of the, try, trying to read things from the outside is like first putting a stethoscope on the wall of a factory, trying to understand what's going on in the factory. It's not going to be effective. At the end of the <laughs> you got to be, <laughs> threads are got to be in there. But I just want to be emphasize again, like the goal is to give people superpowers, um, not, not just to restore prior functionality. So, it's very exciting, and I think that should give hope to a lot of people in the world that the future is going to be exciting and inspiring, and uh, the technology is going to give them superpowers. I mean, that's that's amazing. I guess. Uh, He's off. Uh, yeah. Could, can you multitask with it? Yeah. In fact, if you look at uh, Nolan's uh, streaming, and you can just check out Nolan's streams on on the X platform. He's multitasking all the time, so he's playing video games while talking and. Listening to podcasts. Nice listening to podcasts. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, it's, re it's really just like if you you're, you're using your hands and you t you know playing a video game while talking. So I mean, don't take our word for it. They just go watch. I mean, yeah, yeah, he's out there on the internet doing his thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so can you do keyboard shortcuts or is it just the mouse? Yeah, that, that's actually what we're working on right now. Oh, sure. So currently he's uh, working with the mouse, but we are also exploring decoding more dimensions out uh, from the neural activity, multiple clicks, uh, so to do shortcuts or just. Uh, able to, co to control more games, like control uh, cool games with an Xbox con controller. Uh, but also in the future, we expand, we plan to expand to decode the uh, text, mm -hmm. not just the mouse control, but also allow uh, our participant to type much faster. And, and yeah, faster. actually, so maybe uh, going back to the discussion of thread retraction, you know, one of the very exciting parts to me about this story is that we're able to do so much with 15% of channels. When you have more channels, what that actually offers you is not just faster mouse control, as in the motor cortex neurons don't all represent the same thing. So you're trying to understand like, uh, you know, what an individual finger is trying to do, you might or might not have an electrode next to it. And the more channels you have in the brain, the higher likelihood you have you know, representation or decodability of all fingers on the hand. And so if you're trying to do something like output text at a fast rate, which is something that matters a lot for people who are completely locked in, who cannot speak at all, who are trying to, you know, just say, I love you to, the, to a loved one in their family or ask for a glass of water or a scratch or whatever, you know, being able to type at a fast rate is extremely important. And the more fingers you have access to, higher probability you can do that efficiently. And so, yeah, I, you know, I'm super excited about how, how high the ceiling is we can, uh, that we can get to as we resolve this dead retraction issue. Yeah, I mean, we're, cur like, we're currently at approximately 10, 10 bits per second uh, peak rate, but uh, ultimately we want to get to a megabit. And I think to ultimately whole brain interface, I think, you know, many years from now, I think gigabit level is possible. So that's pretty astonishing. You know, with this is still version one of our device. As we mentioned, it's version one with only 15% of the threads working. The, the current device has... Uh, 64 threads with 16 electrodes uh, on each thread. Our next device has uh, 128 threads oh. with, with eight electrodes per, per thread. Because as we get more confident about how, where exactly to place the thread, you, do, you need fewer electrodes per thread. So we can essentially, with the, with, without substantial changes, potentially double the bandwidth if we are accurate with the placement of threads. And then our next generation device will have uh, even, maybe- Even more channels. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so next device we're aiming for, yeah, uh, 3,000 channels. Uh, so th this will just keep getting better and better, really moving up, I think, in orders of magnitude in factors of 10, basically, in, in what kind of bandwidth. So I think it won't be, it won't be all that long before uh, someone with a Neuralink device can communicate faster than someone who is, has a fully functional uh, body and so, you know, faster than the fastest speed typist or auctioneer. The esports tournaments are going to be like you literally won't goals. be able to speak faster than someone can communicate with a, a neural link telepathy device. It may, it may be a very interesting part of this. Basically, we currently um, connect to standard uh, inputs to the computer through mouse and keyboards. But very soon, as we will have a much broader bandwidth, we need to think about new ways to actually build the interface for the devices. Yeah, no, that's that's a good point um, because the current input devices are centered around human hands. Yeah. yeah. So it's like <laughs> we've got these you know little meat sticks that we move. Uh, there's a certain rate at which you can move your little move your fingers, and and so we've got like the mouse and the keyboard and or the joystick control, you know, like Xbox controller or something like that. But you really don't need that. You can actually, if you're not 
trying to use your hands, you, don't, you actually don't need those yeah. uh, conventional control mechanisms. And so this is why, like, ultimately, I think you'll be able to do uh, conceptual uh, telepathy, like where you can communicate entire concepts uh, uncompressed to s someone else with a neural link or to the computer. Even today, we have some problems here where, like, you know, if you don't feel the mouse clicking under your finger, how do you know it actually happened? Because, you know, you're, you're seeing it on the screen, but you don't actually feel the mouse click. You don't have the proprioceptive feedback of, you know, the keys under your fingertips or the trackpad under your... So there's all sorts of interesting UX challenges how to actually give the user some sense of what their decoder is actually doing or what the neural link is actually doing when they're trying to... So wireless. <laughs> yeah, it's Bluetooth. Yeah. Um, just a Bluetooth connection, just like how your normal Apple mouse or, like, Apple Magic keyboard connects to your computer. Same exact thing. Uh, in fact, in... Yeah, we can basically have this exposed as an HID interface if we want. HID is just the name of the protocol for, like, sending bits from a mouse into a computer. Uh, yeah, I can plug into basically anything. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think we, we chose that interface because it's ubiquitous. Yeah. Basically, any devices are, are have Bluetooth capabilities. Our, our long-term goal is to actually have our own protocol you know, that is safe and secure. Uh, but for now, you know, we've chosen it for interoperability. So the question is, can a Neuralink chip repair the paralysis in the long term? Uh, you know, we can't do that right now. We have done sort of preliminary work implanting a second Neuralink in the spinal cord, and uh, we can restore naturalistic looking hand and leg movements in animal models. Um, but this isn't something that is, you know, don't, don't hold your breath waiting for it. It's going to be a while. We've got a, a lot of work to do. But y yes, there's no reason in theory that we can't repair paralysis. Yeah. I mean, there's no physics barrier to fully solving paralysis. That is perhaps a way to say it, that you've got signals coming from your motor cortex that if they are transferred past the point where the nerves are damaged, essentially just, it's basically a, a communications bridge. Um, so you bridge the communications from the motor cortex um, past the, the, the point uh, in the necrospine where the nerves are damaged. Possible from a physics standpoint to restore full body functionality. A physics standpoint. It's a very hard technical problem, but, it, but it, it, there is nothing that it prevents it happening from a physics standpoint. So in terms of next phases of rollout, well, um, we, we really want to make sure that uh, we, we make as much progress as possible between each uh, Neuralink uh, patient. So this is, we're only just moving now to our second Neuralink patient, but we, we hope to have uh, things go well, high single digits this year. I don't know, maybe this is so, somewhat dependent on regulatory approval uh, and how, how much technical progress we make. But within a few years, hopefully thousands. Yeah, and I think one thing that is important to highlight is that, you know, it, it's not that we built only one device and one surgery. We've done we've hundreds so. of surgery. We've built thousands and thousands of devices, even for just the, the ability yeah. to unearth any sort of low frequency failure mode. So we have already been investing very heavily in infrastructure to be able to scale this thing on the device manufacturing side as well as on the surgery side of things. We want to be able to help as many people as quickly as possible. Yeah. We go through, obviously, the appropriate hurdles right. that are regulatory challenges and proving out the device with one person. The device implantation really needs to become almost entirely, if not entirely, automatic. Uh, in the same way that, say, LASIK eye surgery is done, uh, you, you know, you don't have an ophthalmologist with a, a laser cutter by hand. That, that would be crazy. But the ophthalmologist oversees the, uh, the LASIK machine and makes sure that the settings are correct. And then the, the machine does everything and restores your eyesight. Uh, it's really remarkable how, how many people have had their eyesight restored uh, with, with LASIK. And I think there's another one called Smile. It's, they, they keep making it better. We need to have something similar for a Neuralink implantation so that you basically sit down and whatever, the, the, whatever, whatever kind of upgrades or you know, brain fixes are needed, that's, that's reviewed by a medical expert. <laughs> Obviously, we want to make sure that that is reviewed correctly, but, but it really needs to be uh, automatic. So you sit down, and, and within 10 minutes, uh, you have a Neuralink device installed very, very fast. I mean, it's very sort of cyberpunk, you know, deus ex if you played those games. When will uh, Neuralink <clears throat> start to interface with other devices like wheelchair? It's a great question. We're currently focusing on uh, controlling computers and unlock independence in the virtual world. Of course, our plan is, as you mentioned earlier, robotic arm and a wheelchair to unlock independence in the physical world. This, of course, add uh, additional risk if you make this to a computer. There's uh, some uh, yeah. additional risks to that, but we are working with the FDA to allow us to do quite some. Well, it seems like if, if the wheelchair uh, has a... <laughs> an app. <laughs> well, the wheelchair just needs yeah. to have, some, have an interface. It does, yeah. Yes. <laughs> it does so if, if the wheelchair has a Bluetooth interface, uh, you, you could just Bluetooth interface to the wheelchair. Yeah. And, and that's probably something we should do 
We're working yeah, on yeah, it yeah, pretty yeah. soon. Yeah, it's yeah, really okay. a matter of paperwork of yes, showing yeah. that you can do it safely. You don't want to drive off a cliff. Well, I think we can, <laughs> <laughs> well, we can limit the speed. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, so, yeah. So it doesn't go careening right. off into disaster. Yes, yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, so just <laughs> make it go slowly at first. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so uh, it, 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 really the, the neural device just should work generally for anything that's got a Bluetooth interface. Including potentially an Optimus. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, you could communicate with Optimus. Yep, absolutely. We also we also be able to talk to Optimus, but like, uh, <laughs> why not just beam it? <laughs> but you could just yeah. And instead of talking, you could just you could just beam it directly. Or if if someone has lost the use of speech, then then they can still communicate to an Optimus. Uh, they they can communicate telepathically to Optimus or by Bluetooth. And and so even if someone has completely lost the ability to speak, they could still uh, con control Optimus or their computer or phone. I mean, also like if you have an Optimus and you have a neural, you can just directly map the brain signal to control the physical arm of the robot. And that's a very meaningful thing. Like if you're, you know folks that have spinal cord injury, one of the biggest requests is to be able to scratch yourself. It's something that quite annoying actually. Um, and if you have a scratch on your face, you, like, you can't fall asleep until you scratch it. Uh, you know, it's very convenient to be able to move something physically towards you to be able to scratch. Similar things like eating food. You know, if you need somebody to feed you, it's very hard to have you know, dinner with friends in a way that is you know, sort of a normal, uh, social experience. And so if you can feed yourself, pick up a fork and actually eat a piece of chicken on your own, uh, you know, that's a big deal. Uh, it prevents and saves a lot of interactions with caretakers and other people in your life that you rely on to take care of. It really increases your... I think an exciting possibility long term also is to say, um, if you take parts of the Optimus, Optimus humanoid robot and you combine that with a neural link, let's say somebody has lost their arms or legs, uh, well, we, we could actually attach an Optimus arm or Optimus legs uh, and uh, do a neural link implant so that the motor commands from your brain that go, would go uh, to your, your biological arms now go to your robot arms or robot legs. Um, and again, you'd, you'd have basically cybernetic superpowers. Actually, so the latency from the neural link to your hand would probably be slightly faster than it is yeah. just to go to your physical hand. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine like if you're a piano player or a, I don't know, anything that requires extremely fast you know, hand movements that you could actually have a pretty imbalanced right hand robotic arm control versus left hand physical arm control. Yeah, like I said, it's just kind of a cyberpunk Deus Ex in a future yeah. where you have cybernetic upgrades that are actually better than your biological uh, limbs. And uh, it's certainly that we'll have a much, you know, as, as particularly as we expand to a, a large number of, of um, customers or patients uh, for Neuralink, uh, the understanding of the brain will improve dramatically uh, because uh, there isn't a very fine grained understanding of the brain today because the, there's just the sensors aren't good enough. You've got fMRI, which is pretty good, but it's still not as good as actually having um, high bandwidth electrodes in the brain. Yeah, I think this is underappreciated as a research tool to, to move that whole effort forward of really knowing you know, what the physical substance of human thought is. We don't know uh, to, the, to the degree that we need to. Neuralink is actually a, a very powerful research tool. I, I think we can ultimately understand and, and fix quite severe psychosis or like if, if somebody's got like the if somebody's got like a like a, a delusion that they have a chip in their brain <laughs> yeah I was wondering if you're going to mention that one um, we just want to be clear there's only one person with a neural link chip in their brain um, so for people out there who think we've put a chip in their brain we'd like to assure you for what it's worth you probably won't believe us but we did not put a chip in your brain okay <laughs> um <laughs> so there's actually a remarkable number of people who think we have put a chip in their brain, but we have not. Um, but in the future, if you would like us to put a chip in your brain, which will perhaps help with the issue of thinking that you have a chip in your brain, uh, then we will be able to do so. Uh, so there, there are people that have uh, severe schizophrenia. They've got basically things that um, th their brain is malfunctioning in some way. And this is actually due to really like physical circuitry issues. You can think of the brain as like, it's a biological computer. And if, if some of the circuits are crossed, it's going to crash it's, or it's going to have issues that cause it to not work. But with a Neuralink device, we can fix those issues and, you know, give someone who I think has a say severe schizophrenia or, or psychosis of some kind, uh, allow them to live a normal life. I think that is uh, one of the likely things in the future. You can certainly imagine like, uh, I'm sure people have like parents, grandparents who've you know, have memory that's not working as well as it used to be. Sometimes they, they forget who, who their grandchildren are or, or what day it is. And this is something that a neural link device could help fix. That's actually one of the personal reasons. Um, in, in, in many ways, like forms of, you're, you're literally losing and part of your identity, yeah. which is a, just a very, very... Yeah. 
And it's really just, it's a glitch in the biological computer that is uh, a fixable uh, glitch. It's like, like a, it's a short circuit, essentially. How does the device charge and how long does the charge last? Yeah, so the current version that no one has, it lasts about four to five hours on a single charge and it takes about 45 minutes to charge. One thing we've learned from Noland is that that's actually one of the main limiters for him using it more. Uh, it's actually pretty hard to use a product more than like 70 hours a week. But uh, that's about what he has used it for in some weeks? Yeah, 70 hours mm -hmm. a week, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. just for context, like you sleep roughly eight hours a night. So that's, you know, we're doing better than the bed. Like the bed is 56 hours a week of use roughly. And uh, so 70 hours a week of use is, I challenge you to think about products that you've actually used for that duration. Uh, but that's, like, again, some of these points are worth like emphasizing again, like the, that uh, Nolan, our first uh, Neuralink uh, recipient, uh, ha has used the Neuralink device for 70 hours in a week, which is incredible. You probably won't enjoy that I'm sharing his uh, computer use publicly, but uh, well, <laughs> I mean, I assure you it's for productive things only. No. <laughs> um, but actually, so one of the things we've learned is that in the next version of the device, we really need to like double or you know, increase that battery life. And so I think, uh, DJ, the next version is going to be double, actually double. Yeah. Without, yeah. without uh, increasing the charge. Correct. And charging time yeah. double the battery life, meaning you should get roughly eight hours of use. And the goal is to actually get to all day use. Yeah. Um, yeah so you yeah. can just charge, um, you know, maybe in your sleep or right. a sleeping yeah. pillow. Exactly. As soon as you've got like 16 hours of usage, then you basically have 24 hours of usage because it can charge while you're sleeping. One other thing that's important, I think, to call out here is if you're paralyzed, you can't, you know, put the charger over your head yourself. And so it's important to think about like, it's not just our duration of battery use, but also can you recharge it yourself independently? So we spend a lot of time thinking about how to make that feasible because then that means that you can, and this is what no one does, you can use the device, charge it, use the device, charge it, use the device without needing anybody to come in and sort of help you with that, uh, which is a big deal if you're trying to play Civ until 5 a.m. at night when your family's asleep. And the way in which he does that is that there is a charger coil that's a bigger, you know, about, about this big. Yeah. Um, and we actually put it in the um, sleeve of a, a hat. A little beanie. Wearing, or, yeah. or a beanie, and then he wears it and then says, with the voice command, charge. Charger energize. That's the one he likes. <laughs> yeah. How would writing work? Uh, so, so uh, the current device that Nolan has is is is, is reading. It's trying to re read his essentially like wrist movement from from one one hand. That's also you know worth, worth pointing out. Like in the future, like it would be pretty cool to give Nolan a second implant that would allow the other hand to be used and also have higher. Uh, obviously higher active electrode count so then you could play to essentially play games two-handed because that's normally how you play games and uh but then with with writing uh it's really just a it, you it's an electrical impulse instead of like reading electrical impulses from the neurons you you issue an electrical impulse uh which is obviously critical for vision so vision is is writing which is just tr triggering an ele uh, electrical impulse in the vision part of the brain um and that like activates a a pixel. So we, we actually do have this working um, in monkeys, and we've had, we've, had, we've had it working with monkeys for a while now, uh, where you can sort of flash a pixel and then you watch where the monkey, obviously the monkey's like, what the heck? monkey's a little surprised to see like, hey, there's a flash here and a flash here, but it's gets used to it after a while. Mm -hmm. uh, but it just, you, you can see that, that the pixel is in the right location because the monkey's eyes will, will dart to that location. It's not on, on the screen, right? There's no pixel on the screen. There's no pixel on the screen, yeah. There's no pixel on the screen, yeah. Just like, you just verify that that the, the that you're triggering a pixel yeah. in the right part of the brain. So, you know, the initial resolution for uh, vision will be relatively low. You know, sort of Atari graphics type of thing. But over time, it, it could potentially be better than normal vision. And then I guess in terms of some additional applications for where writing to the brain can be useful, in order uh, applications, as Bliss mentioned, there yeah. is. Feedback, Need feedback. Right? Yeah. There's proprioceptive yeah. feedback. There's a tactile feedback. Especially for um, a robot arm, like if you're trying to grasp a cup, right? Yeah. You need to know you got it. Yeah. One one eggs an egg. Yeah, an egg. To know. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very much a delicate balance of not just initiating the movement, but getting the feedback and controlling it accordingly. So there, there, there is a somatosensory cortex that's yeah. right adjacent to the motor cortex that could, could be benefit motor movements. So any changes in neural growth after the device is inserted? Uh, we, we don't see any, any signs of neural damage. Uh, but I, I, and I guess we, we have seen some rebound on some of the Electrodes, right? Correct, and then also, I mean, I guess, I guess, you know, brain is very plastic. So yeah, it's not that plastic. Well, <laughs> it, it does it? diminish quite a bit after twenty. Right, after throughout 20. childhood, uh, <laughs> especially when you get to about twenty-five, brain really uh, is done cooking. Yeah, uh, huh? but the, huh? there, there are, there is a little bit of damage done with each insertion, uh, but it, it's a minuscule amount compared to anything else. Uh, 
out there. And so it's an easy amount of damage to recover from, and it's really only detectable on cutting pieces of the brain after the animal's no longer alive and looking at them under a microscope. You can't really tell during life that there's been any brain. Good. Another way to interpret this question, have there been any changes in neural growth after the device is inserted? One way to interpret that is like the user learning how to use the device. I think on that side of things, there's been tremendous progress. Mm -hmm. He's put in hundreds of hours trying to figure out the best way to use this device because he really thinks that, you know, if he can figure this out, he can help share this knowledge. I mean, he's like on Friday night at 8 p.m., you know, he's starting a session of like, you know, figuring out himself how to how to push his own performance to the next level. And uh, that's really a unique learning process because there's not many people in the world that have had the experience of moving something with the brain. And so there's a lot of nuance to like, okay, how exactly should I imagine or attempt to move my wrist to get the thing to uh yeah, he's really dialed that into it. Also, just the sheer number of hours that he's yeah, used, it's insane. even in the past six months, right? Yeah. Um, in, in many ways, like, I mean, he's using it in his travel, in, in his plane ride. Effectively, PCI has left the lab. Yeah. 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 I mean, one of the questions is how close we're converting thoughts into text. Right, right now, it's more about moving cursor from the screen on, on a virtual keyboard. But um, long term, it, it, you should be able to really transmit entire words faster than anyone could possibly type. I'm able to type uh, Hello World today. Okay. Right. But we're still in the early days of making that a polished experience. I mean, the other things that we're looking at is sign language, right? Yeah. At the end of the day, it is a movement of a fa of hand yeah. into right. Words. Yeah, that's true. Was the brain trying to naturally push the threads out? I mean, that, this is sort of a universal feature of any implant in the body. The body tries to reject it, uh, and the goal of the surgeons and the technology team is to fight that. And uh, so, with artificial hips and with you know screws in the spine. We've done a really good job of finding biocompatible materials and techniques to uh, fix those implants in the body. I mean, past a certain age, it's getting hard to find someone without some kind of implant, you know, a knee, hip, uh, some kind of screws in their spine. Um, and so we've got this problem pretty well solved. Uh, so to answer your question, yes, the body is trying to get rid of any implant, but we can ensure that basically can't. It's also worth highlighting that the threads have not actually moved um, in the Whoa. past okay. five months. Um, there's there's some still minor movements in terms of like some maybe maybe getting pushed in a little bit, pushed out a little bit, but it's it's more or less very stable and been stable for me. And the reason for that is, you know, once you once you do um, uh, a brain surgery, it takes some time for the tissues to come in and then and then you know the part tissue or the neomembrane uh, to actually come in and then anchor the threads in place. And once that happens, it has been stable and seen much movement. That's where the world direction. record performance starts to come in. Yeah, that was a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, yeah uh, the, the threads, it, like it, it is important that the threads be extremely tiny. If they're extremely tiny, then the, the brain uh, does not, the, the smaller they are, the less likely the brain is to react to, to them. So uh, that's why you want the threads to be extremely tiny and also to minimize uh, any damage to neurons. By the way, on that note, we, we yeah. do plan to actually share some of the um, you know the tissue response in detail in some of the the later upcoming updates. Yeah, I mean, it is quite a challenging. Um, it's challenging on many fronts to do something like this uh, because you're you're trying to read and read and write uh, electrical signals, but you need to have the, the threads themselves need to be uh, electrically isolated <laughs> and not subject to corrosion in the body. So like mm -hmm. the you know just Metal by itself is somewhat subject to corrosion or, or being attacked. So it's like in terms of the various coatings and things to actually make this electrode work while not actually eroding its performance over time is, is very difficult. Human body is a very, very harsh environment. Very harsh um, environment. You know, it's a, it's a yeah. bag of salt water with yeah. bad sensors that's elevated temperature that is well regulated. I mean, I'm sure people have experienced dropping their electronic devices in the seawater and in an instant. So we'll we better sort of wrap, wrap this up soon. Um, if there's like a few, a yeah, few last questions. questions. Um, I guess, so a, a good question. So what about uh, upgrades? Um, so yeah, we, we, we do think it's going to be important to be able to upgrade the device over time. Uh, just like you wouldn't want um, like an iPhone 1 stuck in your brain forever. Uh, you, you, you know, if, if you've got an iPhone 15, you probably want the iPhone 15, not the iPhone 1. I think people over time will uh, be able to upgrade their, their Neuralink. So we'll take the Neuralink device out um, and put a new one in. And uh, we, we have done this with um, some of our animals, and they, they've actually, in one case, we did it with, we, we, we upgraded a device three times, and, and uh, was it with a pig? Or? Yeah, we did it with a monkey as well. Oh, monkey, yeah, he's yeah. able to yeah. do PCI. Yeah, so, and, and, and he's, he's doing fine. Yeah, yeah. Pager has Pager. the latest implant.
Yeah. Yeah. Actually, he hit his, I think his record with the last yeah. yes. with the with an upgrade. No, so it still beat him though. Uh-huh. Yeah. Still beat him. Yes, mm-hmm. this is true. Humans are top of the species leaderboard <laughs> right now. Page is like what, like eight or something? Page is like eight point five BPS. Okay. Well, that's a very high score. Yeah. Um, I'm not trying to put Pedro down, and also to train a monkey to do that is like a whole challenge on its own. We have like the best animal care team in the world. <laughs> yeah, I just do want to emphasize we 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 do our absolute best to take care of the, the animals. Um, uh, when we had like a, a USDA inspector come through, she said that uh, this was the, the nicest animal uh, facility she has ever seen in her entire life. I mean, they so, order breakfast on an app. The monkey orders room service. Yes, I'm not even kidding. Yeah, we're, we're, we're yeah. monkey room service, which is uh, rare. Um, in fact, exc- we're the only ones who offer monkey room service. <laughs> so we, we really do everything we can to uh, maximize the welfare of the animals. All right, with that, uh, thank you everyone for tuning in. Uh, Hope you found this uh, interesting.